So we want to make sure that we have something that's unique and reflects us as a culture. Words, ideas, ingredients, and patterns that really reflect us as people of color or Black people is really important for us. Things that you will not find at Urban Outfitters or Anthropology or H&M. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey, guys, welcome. Welcome back to the show. Today in the guest chair, we have Anika Hobbs, the founder of Nubian Human. Nubian Human is a social enterprise that specializes in sourcing unique goods, fashion, and art by designers representing the global diaspora. It has become a catalyst for culture, community, and the development of the creative economy by connecting the consumer to independent artists from across the world and serving as a means to promote collective interaction, community development, and global responsibility through a fresh and artistic brick and mortar platform. Nubian Human has worked with over 400 artists in 30 countries and across six different continents to date. And it has also received recognition from our forever president, Barack Obama, The Washington Post, NPR, and most recently Forbes. Welcome to the guest chair, Anika. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am so happy to have you here. Now, first things first, give us a peek in your own words, you know, into the life of Anika. What would you like everyone to know? And when were you bitten by the entrepreneurship bug? Oh, man. So um, I guess some things about me is that I had a crazy uh, background. Um, My background is not actually in retail. So um where I started was pretty much I went to school for interior architecture. I graduated from Syracuse University a while ago. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and when I got out of school, my mom was like, you know, these bills are coming in. You need to be able to pay these loans. So I started working for H&M as a sales associate, you know, which for me was already like I have this big degree from Syracuse, but I didn't have a portfolio. I didn't have a resume. I didn't have the connections. So um, I started working with H&M really, really when they were really, really young in the U.S. Oh, wow. And when you say interior architecture, what was when you majored in that? What what was it that you wanted to do? I wanted to become an architect. I still want to become an architect, but I wanted to become I was going to school for architecture. So um, it's technically environmental design. So we pretty much learned how to uh, build and design the interior of spaces. All right. So you started working at H&M and I know that had to, like you said, it it was not what you expected to do after you graduate from the Syracuse University. So how long did you work for H&M and how were you navigating your career as you worked for them? Were you trying to get out or were you just rising within the company? Um, So I worked for them for 11 years. Um, and they were so new to the U S so it was kind of like a different company than it is now. So it was so much smaller that we were really close to CEOs, corporate, all of that is based in Sweden. And, you know, when they used to open stores, they would bring over people from Germany, Sweden, all parts of Europe, New York, um, because the store that I opened in Boston was like the eighth store and they have well over 300 stores at this point. So One thing that I didn't really know about at the time was because my background wasn't in retail was visual merchandising. And because I had a design degree, I was really, really interested in visual merchandising. So not long after being a sales associate did I become a visual merchandiser. What exactly was what is a visual merchandiser? So pretty much we're the ones that make the store look pretty. So all of that, like, you know, how the clothing is laid out by color combinations, styling mannequins, um, all the floor layout of the fixtures and things like that. That's what we're responsible for. So the, the high look vision of the company we're supposed to implement in our individual stores. Isn't it funny how you're background in architecture, you might not have wanted to be a visual merchandiser, but I'm sure that also kind of came into play as you were doing that. It did. And that was one of the things that allowed me to actually grow in the company. So um, I spent probably like two and a half years 
as a visual merchandiser, opening stores. So I would, every two weeks I would be in another state. So I would be like in San Francisco, then I would be in Chicago, I'd be in Toronto. I opened their first store in China. And it was just like a lot of traveling and using my skills that I didn't think that I could use to apply to my new career. So that was really, really awesome. That does sound awesome. And one other thing about that, you know, because I don't want to gloss over this. And and I think it's so important to your broader story is that this visual merchandising thing, it is so important. Like they're they're literally H&Ms that are my favorite H&Ms because Mm -hmm. I know I go in there and there's something about the experience. But what it is, is the store has been merchandised so that I want to shop. But if it's too crowded or cluttered or I can't immediately see a look presented to me, then it's like, okay, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm leaving. So it's so important to getting people to shop to have a good visual merchandiser. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that, especially coming into a brick and mortar retail space. Um, So like one of the people that we studied in college was Paco Underhill. And he wrote a few books on basically the psychology of people in space. So how color, um, the sound, the smells, even like the thickness of your carpet, like what that does for people coming in and out of your space. Does it turn their feet to the left and does that make them feel uncomfortable? I've just always been fascinated by that process and and people in space. So luckily that $50,000 a year did pay off (laughs) my my career. (laughs) Yes. And now when did the seeds for Nubian humans start taking root? You know, it, it's really interesting because when I graduated and I started working for H&M, there was myself and one of my best friends. We're still really, really close now. And um, a soror of mine, she, we, we would come together and we were just all like, we want to start businesses. So it was probably really early out of college that I was just like working at H&M and I'm like coming to, into the stores and I'm like, you know, we're always dealing with, uh, you know, pencil skirts and, you know, blouses and pants, but In my travels, I would find like amazing, amazing jewelry and fashion by all of these independent artists. And my thing was, is, you know, when I try to find them again, I wouldn't be able to. And this is before, you know, when everybody had their own website. So it was kind of like, how do I find everyone? And I was like, I'm going to make my own store of all these like beautiful things that I really, really love and that everybody keeps asking about. So really early on, I would say... I started to get that bug. Like we would start to read business books together, like Black Enterprise business book. That was like the first one we read. And we just kind of kept holding each other accountable to our dreams. That's so awesome to have that. So it was kind of like a little mastermind, you know, like you guys were keeping each other accountable. Now, Mm -hmm. when that seed started to take root, what plan did you start to put into action? Like what pieces did you know you wanted to have together before you started this? I think for me was I was I was, you know, heavy on the creative design side because I was right out of school. And I was, you know, because I was basically dealing with artists as visual merchandisers. But as a business person, I didn't really have an understanding of that process. So even as I grew with H&M, you know, once I became you know, like store manager, like visual manager of a store and then district. Um, I just really focused on learning the business side, you know, like how many units per transaction should we have? Um, what's the average dollar sales and how do we measure success and how do we create business goals? Um, and so I would take classes. So I did like score, which they didn't really understand. You know, it's kind of like old white men who didn't really <laughs> understand. And can you break down what score stands for again? I know we've uh, a few guests have mentioned, but I always like to remind. I actually I'm not sure what score, what the acronym of score is. Here, I'll look it up while you, you speak, you guys. So, you know, real time, real time action right now. But, <laughs> but, but share what it, it provides in each city. Yeah. So what there, there is a location in the city. So basically they're more so like retired, uh, business people who, who dedicate their time to those that want to get into business. So they help with like your business plan, your marketing plan. If you don't understand accounting, how to understand a, a profit and loss statement, balance sheet, um, So basically, they kind of help you build your business. They give you resources and things like that. Okay, I don't think it stands for anything, you guys. But (laughs) yes, SCORE (laughs) SCORE helps small businesses and provides all these resources. And right now, you know, I actually know friends who volunteer for SCORE, work with SCORE. So it's not just old people anymore. Um, Yeah, (laughs) I mean, in the early 2000s, it it definitely was. So that's good. What kind? You took some classes with SCORE. 
Yeah. And I would just, you know, basically it was, it was a huge conflict of interest. I was taking these classes and getting this advice at night. Um, and because I was in retail, it was, it was a conflict of interest, but Mm. you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, (laughs) But yeah, and I mean, anything throughout the business, I would just bank that information. So with H&M, you know, we're sitting in our meetings and, you know, we go over with, you know, our country level teams, we would go over information. I was just pretty much learning like processy, you know, like you learn like what, how they work through their seasons. How do they work with old stock? How do they come up with new brands? What do they need to activate a campaign? Um, and like I said, because at the time it was so small, you were able to see so much. And I learned a lot from, you know, the entire team there from, you know, store level to corporate level because we were, um, so close. Um, and also with the company, I also relocated. So I knew that I wanted to be where, you know, Nubian human is, you know, focused on people of color. So I wanted to be, I was located in Boston. That's where I'm from. And I wanted to be further down south. My family is, you know, from Alabama, so they're further down south. And I wanted to be in a community that looked like me. I wanted basically, you know, I believe that the store, the mission and everything is to surround itself with people of color. Yeah. So um, they were going to relocate me to Atlanta or D.C. and I chose D.C. So that's how I ended up there. So H&M relocated you. Mm-hmm. And yep. as you were, you mentioned that you opened the Boston store. As you were doing that, were you also also making note of what it takes, the real estate side of brick and mortar, what it takes to choose a location, make sure it's a prime location and all of that? Yeah, that was a huge part of the process. I was looking at retail spaces in Boston, and that's how I knew at that point that I wanted to be further down south. Because in, in Boston, there really wasn't the space that I was looking for mm-hmm. um, within the communities that I wanted to be in. Mm. So um, I just figured like down south would have a, a larger, basically, impact of what, you know, what, what I was trying to do. So now about how long did it take you from the time you relocated to D.C. to actually physically open Nubian Human? So I came to D.C. in 2000 at the end of 2009 um, and I opened Nubian Human. I stopped working for H&M in 2012. I took a year off and then we opened in 2013. So it took about four years um, but it was a great opportunity to learn the m- retail market here. So it's it's different in every state, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so I was able to really learn through H&M dollars, you know, how staff works in the D.C. area, the DMV area, which I didn't know before. So D.C., Virginia and Maryland stores were the stores that I had once I moved down here as a district manager. And um, just learning their hiring process and how people work. You know, it's, I was used to Boston. I was used to New York, which is quick, fast, you know, like get it done. Yeah. But it's further south. So it's a little bit different. So I got to learn that while I was, you know, since I've been here. So I took that time and then I, I left in 2012. And what did you do? You, you mentioned you take you took a year off. So how did you prepare for your leave? Did you have a lot in savings at that time? And then to support yourself while you, the store wasn't bringing in income. It didn't even, you know, wasn't fully developed yet. And then you still, Mm -hmm. you weren't working for, for H&M anymore. Right. So pretty much I, my dad was really, really good at saving. So he taught me how to, to save money, like basically live below your means. Um, so because I was traveling so much, I would get paid per diem, you know, so they would feed me pretty much for lunch, breakfast and dinner, and then any type of, you know, transportation needs. And, you know, I mean, I don't eat like a hundred dollars a day while traveling. So I would save it. So for pretty much, I would say for about eight years out of the 11 years that I was there, I was saving. And, um, because I became a district manager, I was a district manager for about four or five years. Um, you know, we had a company car, we had a company cell phone. So there was just things that I could just, I wasn't driving my personal car. I could have the most basic cell phone plan because I had a company phone. Mm. So I was able to just save a lot. So when I left, I had about $40,000 in cash savings. Oh, wow. And when did you know it was time to pull that trigger and leave? Oh, oh my goodness. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was a really pivotal point for me. So my dad lived in New Mexico at the time and he was really, really sick. So I had to move him to Maryland, which is where I live. And that was a huge process for me because I was out of work for about a month and a half. 
um, getting him set up and getting him back well. And when I returned, I had a new, uh, I had a new boss and he was pretty much like, I need you to give like 125%. And after coming off of the, you know, time that I had with my dad, and then we also had the biggest districts at the time. So we had the most stores. It was close to 30 stores that we were managing. Um, it was kind of like, I just don't have it. And I told him I, the best I can give you is a hundred percent, but anything past that I can't do. And I just knew that, you know, this was a new manager who came in with fire and I just didn't have it. And I kind of had felt that way before. Um, you know, I had been a district manager for a while and then the next position that they wanted me in was in New York and I couldn't move to New York because I had just moved my dad. So um, which would have been the perfect job because it was basically laying out this, it was doing the interior architecture, the, you know, the drawings and stuff for new stores, which is like what I went to school for. But um, I wasn't able to take that job. And so I kind of felt like I was at a dead end and, you know, my energy was tired. So I was just like, next day I came in and I gave him, you know, my letter. Wow. And when you say your energy was tired, but you still had this fire for your business idea. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was new, you know, and I always felt like I had fire for the my staff and my team. They worked really hard for me at H&M. Um, I, you know, some of them I actually hired for Nubian Human. But, oh, look at that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I just I, I did have a fire for that. I knew that there was a market. I knew that there was an opportunity for yeah. it. So I didn't see it around me at the time. It wasn't as popular as it is now. Uh -huh. So that's why I was like, I need to get on this. And, you know, I would talk with my controller, who basically is the accountant for your district. So we would work hand in hand. And so I'd be like, can I go now? And so he would basically break down the math for me. And he's like, I think it's a good time. And I'm like, I'm out. All right. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of breaking down the math and a good time, now what was always interesting to me is, OK, it's one thing to save, but was there stress once you left and your saving starts to dwindle? You know, what did you do? How did you feel as you're starting up this new business concept and it's depleting the savings? Yeah, good question. I so for a little bit, I would say I think maybe three or four months out of that year, I actually started working for restoration hardware. OK, um, because I got so nervous seeing the account go down that I was like, oh, man, I need to do something because I'm still paying rent. I still have to eat. I still have, you know, car insurance. So um, I started working for them for like four months, which was really, really great because I got to learn about hard goods. Um, you know, I got to learn about basically luxury mm -hmm. uh, because I was so used to fast fashion and they have a really great culture, really, really great culture that it's really, really inspiring. So I learned a lot from them in that short amount of time, but yeah, I had to work. I was like, I need to, to work quick. Yes. So, I mean, the 40,000 obviously wasn't all gone, but I needed still startup money. And, you know, one other one thing I love about this fact that you work for retail and initially as someone who graduates from, you know, private university or just college in general, it's almost it's looked down upon. But these are businesses that were founded by people like this. This is another place where you can be on the ground learning. There is right. no job that is beneath anyone like there is right. something to learn from mm -hmm. that. And now look at you starting what could be the next. H&M restoration hardware, you know what I mean? And yeah. for us. So kudos to you, girl. Now, Thank you. Let, let's talk about the early days. So you quit. You're working. You're, you're keeping up the cash flow. What were you doing to start New Being Human? Were you sourcing, um, you know, researching locations? Were you starting to source artists at that point? Yes, all of that. So I was pretty much like scouring everything I could. I was going to, you know, a bunch of events, learning about artists. Um, I was going to university. So I, you know, spent time at Howard University. That's how I met um, Ariel from Beads by Artie. She was our first, first artist ever. Um, and yeah, I was pretty much working on getting the name out there. And so I built, I had a website built, which was like, probably not the smartest thing to do because I spent close to like a thousand dollars on a logo and a website and the website couldn't even take like online orders. Oh, I didn't no. know what I was doing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, this makes no sense. And then I learned Shopify, which okay. cost me $30 a month. And I'm right. like, yeah. I mean, you live and, you you live learn. and learn. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so you were online first. So when did you decide to open a brick and mortar? 
So, you know, actually, I wanted a brick and mortar before online and everybody was like, no, you got to have a website. So I was like, OK, but um, but yeah, so not long, at, probably about seven, eight months after I became online is when I opened the brick and mortar. But I spent a lot of time like hustling like I was pretty much I was making my own jewelry, which was not good at all. Like it's not good. Like the people still wear it. And I'm like, I can't believe those earrings still held together. <laughs> and <laughs> They're not falling apart. Oh my gosh. Like I started with one was like a feather earring and they were just kind of like hot glued together. And <laughs> if it rained, it was like goodbye to your feather earring. Like it was bad, but you know, some of them were pretty good, but. And what was the original concept? This is a, a, a marketplace for goods and artists f- across the African diaspora. Yeah. I mean, like I would go to BAM every summer mm-hmm. in Brooklyn. Explain what BAM is. <laughs> so it's the Brooklyn Arts Museum. They have a dance festival. It's an African dance festival every year. And I would go to like their marketplace every summer. I think it might be in July, maybe. And. Um, back then it was so huge and people were doing the contemporary looks with Ankara like 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago. Nobody really knows that, but um, because it wasn't as huge here in the States. And so it was before Instagram was like big. All yeah. of that. Yeah, it was before all of that. So I would see brands like Harriet's Alta Ego. She was doing, um, you know, pieces that were already like that. And I'm like, man, like, how do I get this to the masses? That was my thing. It's like, how do, how do we get people to know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my thing was just like being out there talking to these artists, getting their information, even, and because social media became, and the internet helped the world to kind of become small. It was like, you know, I would reach out to artists like Tina Labondi. She's located in the UK in London. And, you know, she was one of the first designers that we had in the store. And it was just like, can I buy your stuff? And she's like, okay. And then that was it. You know, there was no real process to it at the time. And how does it work as far as the process of actually fulfilling the goods to the customer? Are you the middle person or is it strictly you're connecting them to the artist and then it's happening and they're responsible for fulfillment? Yeah, I mean, before before I had a buyer on my team, it was pretty much me reaching out to artists, speaking directly to them. And then them sending a line sheet or pictures or whatever they had. And then I'm just straight buying from them. But, you know, as we've gotten bigger now that I have a buyer, you know, we talk about we negotiate, we're able to negotiate pricing. We're about, you know, working on shipping, international shipping, which is huge for us. So it's a little bit of a different process now. We actually have a purchasing agreement um, for, that my attorneys created. So there's it's a real process at okay. this point. Mm-hmm. And as you were starting out the online process and people started buying and things like that, were you ever intimidated by the whole brick and mortar aspect of it? Because that takes a chunk out of the revenue. Yeah. It, I mean, it was huge. Like I, you didn't, you really can't, don't realize how quickly money goes once you start buying inventory. But, um, opening a store was not the scary part because I had spent all those years with H&M opening stores. Okay. So I knew that process. Uh, the scary part was like, okay, so how do we stay open? You know, yes. like, how do we stay relevant? And so, so I literally would be out in the streets. I would be at the store all day. And then if there were events at Howard University, if it's homecoming, I was that girl that was at the let out, passing out flyers. I don't care if it was cold. Um, any party that I knew was happening, any event, I was there passing out flyers or I was vending. And I was vending like anywhere that I could just so people knew the name. That was like the biggest thing for me. Anywhere in the DMV, I needed people to know the name of Nubian Human, especially before I even opened. It was kind of like a big ramp up, like we're opening a store, we're opening a store. So when we did open the doors, we had a really great turnout. Now tell us about the space, because this is, Anika, this is not your average space. This ain't no H&M. This isn't no restoration hardware. So walk the listeners through, like give them a visual and just the, the aroma and the aura of when they step through the doors of Nubian Human. Yeah, so we try to basically make a space of Black excellence. So from the smell, you smell soaps from Bayou Soaps, which, you know, I just said on radio, it smells like heaven. So Mm -hmm. it's like 
mango, grapefruit, black soap. You can smell the shea butters. You can smell everything. Um, and, you know, we make sure that we have music that we can all connect to, you know, so it's awesome to see people singing Afro beats or, you know, singing Badu. It's, you know, we really make sure that we connect people on the, the sonic part of it too. And then just visually, it's, we really like to have order. We like to have things where they're supposed to be. Um, a lot of our stores buy color combinations and departments. And we like for people on average, people spend about 25 minutes in the store because we want you to stay, pick up, turn it around, smell it, read the label, ask questions. Let's talk about where that print came from. Let's talk about the ingredients in this product and how it can help you. So um, for us, customer service is huge. We know that as people of color, we kind of have this, you know, label of not providing good customer service. So we want you to feel like you're at home. You're having a conversation with a sister or a brother, and we're here to support you and connect you and, you know, basically make you feel good about where you're voting your dollar to be. So that's our big focus. And did you utilize any funding resources to open up the space? I didn't actually. So that all of that was basically from my father did lend me um, a few thousand dollars, which I had to pay back. <laughs> <laughs> See, that is the difference between us and some other entrepreneurship shows. <laughs> right. You don't hear right. that, right? Yes. <laughs> we got it. We had to give that back. <laughs> yes. Um, but then, yeah, I just pretty much used my savings. And then anything that the store brought in, I put right back into the company. So I didn't start paying myself until like probably a year or so ago. And we've been in business for five years. Wow. So, Yeah. Um, but I am at this point looking into other options because we're opening a store in Baltimore. What would you say are your biggest categories and how do you manage the inventory? Now you have a buyer, you mentioned that, but, um, how do you make it so that your customers know what to expect? Um, so we do a lot of study and research. So we look at our numbers a lot. You know, we try to understand uh, the customer journey as much as possible. We try to understand what they like when they buy it. So, you know, for us, it was like I would buy all this clothing in the holiday season thinking that people want to buy clothing. But during that time, people are looking for gifts. So then, you know, we kind of altered shifted how we do our buying during the seasons. Our peak season for a lot of people when it comes to apparel, um, you know, is the holidays. But for us, it's the summer because when people think about African fabric, Ankara, they think summer, they think spring or summer. So for us, we have increased apparel purchasing in the summer. So a lot of it is just really thinking about how does our customer buy. And then online, we realized, you know, like clothing is a little bit harder for us to sell online. So we really focus on having more of the beauty products and uh, gifts online. So any of the homeware, candles, things like that, we end up turning a lot better on our online stores. And when did you incorporate the events? Uh, honestly, we opened in September. October was our first, <laughs> it was our first trunk show. Um, you know, just as you, as soon as you get in, you realize if, if nobody's coming in, then you kind of have like dead space, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't just look at your physical space as just for this one thing. It has to be a multi stream space. So I was like, okay, well, let's start having trunk shows and then let's start having private events and then book readings and things like that. So what could we continuously do to get people in the store? So literally, the, the months after I opened was our first trunk show. I think that is so smart because foot traffic is something that all brick and mortars uh, struggle with right now. And if you're not giving a compelling reason for people to come into your store, it's like they won't know that any of those things are there. Now, once they're there, they'll happily buy stuff because they're like, oh, I didn't know this was here. But right. how do you get them there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially us with the challenge of, you know, we're already east of the river, which is, you know, not the heart of D.C. It's, mm -hmm. you know, across the river, but we're still in D.C. And then we're inside of a building on south east of the river. So there are a couple barriers to entry that we're completely aware of. And so that's why events became really huge for us, too. When you were thinking of, of you know, when you were looking for a location, what made you settle on that location and the neighborhood itself? Was it important to you to be in that specific neighborhood? You know, I was looking in different. So actually, I was looking in Maryland for a little while. And then I was looking um, in another part of D.C. for a very long time. And there was nowhere that kind of was like, OK, 
this is where I feel really, really good at. And then I didn't have to do a lot of work in. And so my mentor was like, well, why don't you try the Anacostia Art Center? So I said, okay, I'll try there, which is a totally interesting thing because about a year and a half before I had actually signed my lease there, I had done a vending event inside that space. Had no idea that it was going to end up being where I was going to be. But um, they had totally renovated it. It was turnkey. And it was just really, really great opportunity for someone who was, you know, just learning brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. So it was just it was a perfect opportunity. So, yeah. So since then, we've we've expanded. We've doubled the size of our space through a grant that we received. But um, it was definitely like a good opportunity. Okay, And was that grant that that was something you applied for? Was it through another organization like SCORE? No, it was actually through D.C., uh, D.C. government. So we applied for the grant. Um, It's called the Great D.C. Great Streets Grant, which is for brick and mortar stores. And we we received fifty thousand dollars to make some capital improvements. So that's awesome. Yeah, it helped a lot. It helped a lot. Did you face any mental or physical roadblock during this whole process? You know, you sound very resilient and also very determined, like you were just one track mind, tunnel vision, let's get this open. But were there any roadblocks that made you ever just feel like quitting or like it wouldn't happen? Um, Not so much on the side of like the opening part. I think um, some of the mental roadblocks as far as like once I was open was you know, like, how do I stay cool? And how do I manage all of this? How do I manage so much? So, you know, you're the sales associate, you're the store manager, you're the customer service person managing online. I think a lot of times, like for me for a while, I didn't really realize like your online store is actually a store and you also have your brick and mortar store. So Mm. technically you have two stores. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't look at it like that. So it was kind of like, I was I'm stretched in a lot of different places. And for me, it's just like a lot of mental fatigue, you know, learning your accounting, like math is so huge and retail that, you know, it was like bookkeeping. I was falling behind on taxes. I was falling behind on. And especially in DC, when you have a brick and mortar, there's so many different taxes that come throughout the year. You know, you're like, oh my gosh, how'd I keep up? So I think for me, it was a mental fatigue of like just handling everything, you know? And I think also because I'm an only child and I'm, you know, there's a a certain way of how I like things. Um, instead of hiring people, I would just do it all myself. Mm. And that really burnt me out. And it continues to sometimes, but burn me out really bad. Now, at what point did you change that trying to do everything yourself? Um, I would say probably about a year in, I hired um, a sales associate and she worked there part time, which allowed me to not be at the desk all the time. Um, And so I was able to have like, you know, breakouts, lots of time that I didn't have, you know, to, to be interrupted, uninterrupted time to work on the things like the books and the research and things like that. That helped me a lot. I think also once I started, um, having a buyer as well, because that negotiation, that talking process with independent artists is completely different than when you're buying from somebody who's really well established. So tell us a little bit more about what the buyer does for the business and would you recommend it for other boutique owners? Um, So what our buyer does is she pretty much researches what is out there and she handles the conversations the conversation person, the liaison between myself and that artist. And so she, she also filters through because we get a lot of people wanting to be a Nubian human. And we probably only take about 30 percent of those that actually apply to us. Um, so she kind of filters through all of all of the applications and things like that. She also supports with uh, working with the artists on like what we need and what will also help them to scale. So you know, a lot of them don't know what a line sheet is. So we have a conversation about what that looks like, or even figuring out their cost of goods and wholesale pricing. We talk through that process as well. Um, so she helps with that part of it. And then, um, like I said, we do a lot with our numbers. So we break down our numbers. How much does it cost for shipping per item? What is the taxes on this? You know, any type of that, anything like that we have to pay. Um, she does that process for us. 
That's such an important point because we won't get into, I mean, I mean, we could into the breaking down of how, how do you price for wholesale? How do you figure right. out what your cost of goods sold is? And the thing that I love about what you're doing with New Being Human, you know, I've heard you say that it's kind of like you, you are focused on building wealth through the creative economy. And one yeah. of the things that we need to know in order to build wealth is what it takes for us to produce a product. What is actually profit? You know, like every single thing we spent money on in the process. And then we need to know how to scale that. Right. right. So how do you look at New Being Human in the larger scheme of helping with building wealth through the creative economy? I think for me, it's it's figuring out where the holes are when it when it comes to certain things. I think, you know, in the beginning, it was like, I just want to have a store. <laughs> and, you know, now it's become like I want to build out an incubator because I, I understand that there's a need and a specific type of incubator. I yes. think there's a lot of incubators out there, but I want to be very specific and intentional with what happens through that. Um, and then after that, how do we support them in that scaling process with getting access to other boutiques that may be interested in holding their product? So I think it's for me, it's about seeing the gaps, building the pipelines um, in order for us to to keep it going beyond just these small moments of interactions between each other. I think that's what's important for me. Like how do you, building that long wealth is not just about having this one quick moment of me buying your goods and then right. that's it. But how do we build a relationship that we grow? And you you don't do that with everyone, but um, at least if you can get a good amount, then you've done your part. And on that same topic, a lot of people lose money in the first few years of their business. Mm -hmm. What What was your experience, especially as you started to hire um, you know, that was always a really scary thing, you know, like, oh, if I spend the money, I could actually buy more inventory, but then maybe this person could actually bring in, but you know, it was a hard balance, but, um, you know, for the first couple of years, we were very, very lean. I was very, very lean, um, on how I built my business. And then I would, so the profitability was actually pretty decent, which is not normal for a new business or a new store. We actually did have minimal, but we had profit. And then I would say between years three and four, um, we lost a bit because I started hiring more people. But then also when we went through the construction phase, which is something I didn't account for, uh, you know, the store had to be closed or the store was dusty or we didn't have as much inventory. So that kind of hurt us a bit. So, with the, you know, it's it's been an up and down thing. But, you know, as of now, we are a profitable business, which is really important. Otherwise, I can't keep doing it. But right. Oh, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. But I think a lot of it is, is just, you know, knowing your audience, knowing what people like, knowing how long they like it for. Mm -hmm. um, I think also for us, it's like not being scared to have product that was made by us that has our brand on it. Because mm. I was like, I don't want to be a designer. I don't want to do any of that. But if the cost is low and you can create it, do it. Like fill, fill the gap is what's important. Yes. And speaking of products, what do you look for? You mentioned a lot of people pitch new being human. So what are you looking for? What is the criteria? How do you pass the test? Mm -hmm. So we really obviously, you know, we, we try to make sure that, you know, the founder or at least 50 percent is black owned or minority owned. Um, and then we also look for quality goods. So basically, if you were to look at us, a lot of people would categorize us as a luxury retailer because of our price point. So we want to make sure that we have quality that matches our price point. Um, and then also something that's unique and reflective and reflects us as a culture. Um, so things that we can relate to words and, and ideas and ingredients and patterns that really reflect us as people of color or black people is really important for us. Things that you will not find at Urban Outfitters or Anthropology or H&M. And what's next for New Being Human? Uh, so we're opening, like I said, we're opening our second store in Baltimore, which is really exciting at the end of the summer. Um, you're actually the first to know. So <laughs> side as a pro exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> 
So we're really excited about that. You know, we've got some great artists in Baltimore. So um, we're glad to we're just excited to be able to bring our artists up there and, and partner with artists there. Um, we're also working on a nonprofit side of the work that we do. Mm-hmm. So we already kind of do, everybody keeps saying, you do the work, you just need to be a nonprofit. So we're actually building out the nonprofit arm in order to um, really, really hone in on supporting businesses of color. Um, and then we're also working on a couple like apps and things like that to kind of help our artists with getting um, bigger reach to a bigger audience. So I love that. Yeah. <laughs> now, one thing I want to touch on before we jump into the lightning round is personal sacrifice. So oh, yeah. you have a physical location. You you basically have two businesses, as you said, because of the the online, the physical location, then you're opening a nonprofit and a new location. And right. and I'm all for it because, like I said, I want this to be, you know, the, the next great big uh, retail brand owned by a black woman. But when do you get to not work? Um, yeah, we're still working on that. So <laughs> and you know what the interesting thing is, is like, you have for me, it's like I have to realize that you're I'm still working sometimes, yes, you know, like yes. I'll go places and I'm like, well, let me go here because it inspires me. And I just really want to like or I'll, sh- you know, pick up things at a new type of store. Um, like we just had our biggest event, which is the Black Love Experience. And so I'm like, let me go to Restaurant Depot, which is so exciting for me just to see stuff in bulk. I don't know why. But, um, you know, that was still business, even mm. though I you know, so. I do think it's really important that you do have that work-life harmony. I don't know if a balance is necessarily possible, but some sort of harmony with it. Um, I would say the most time that I really don't work is during sleep, but I love what I do. I genuinely love what God has shown me to do here. And so, you know, very rarely does it actually feel like work. I get tired. I do. I get burnt out but I still love it. You know, my purpose is greater than just like opening doors and selling clothes. Mm. So, um, it is something that I do need to work on. You do, you do sacrifice. You know, I told my girlfriends, like, I need to be better, a better friend to you. So that's something that I'm focusing on. You know, my dad passed away. And so my mom, you know, I'm like, I need to be a better daughter to my mom, you know, like Mm. I'm an only child. So I really do focus on trying to be a better person to those that I am close to because that's important. They, they're, you know, they're my rock. They support me. So. Yes. But we're not going to end this question with you being down on yourself, though, because we're all oh, doing not. the best we can. We're all doing the best we can. And, and yeah. I, I, you know, I feel that 100% and sometimes just looking up and being like, I want to be better at X. And um, something my husband tells me, which is helpful, is that, you know, you don't need to be an A plus at everything. Like right. the, the go getter in us will sometimes feel so terrible if we're a B minus, a B plus in some areas. But it is, you know, it's not, maybe in, in, in high school and college, there are times when you can get straight A's. But in life, the right. harmony is more important than uh, yes. the straight A's in every yeah. single area. And I mean, I think it's also important to get away. So like, you know, mm-hmm. in next week, I'll be in Jamaica for about a week and a half. Okay. And I'm just like, yeah. you know, you do need to vacate. You do need to stop because you will. And I've done it like you will burn out at some point if you're just always, always doing it. So right. and you're no good to your business if you're burnt out, you know, like you, right. they need you. So, yeah, yeah, I'm glad. All righty. So now let's jump into the lightning round. You just answer the very first thing that comes to mind. You ready? Oh, ready. All right. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Um, I would say w- one thing for me was r- reading. Reading helps a lot. So like I read uh, retail math very early in the game and that completely helped me understand my business. That was huge. See, I was going to add next question. What's been the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? Mm-hmm. I, how I built this is my favorite. It's it's an NPR podcast. It's one of yes. one of my favorites. Yeah, um, people mentioned that, and and that's the one I was saying. Like you, you don't hear about people giving back the money on how I built this right. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, never do. You never do. <laughs> All right, number three. What is a non negotiable part of your morning routine? Um, you know, I don't really have the greatest morning routine, but I would say the the a non negotiable for me is rest. Mm. Like you have to sleep. Like, I, I don't, you've got to get your seven, eight hours of rest. 
I did that whole like no rest, you know, grind till I'm, you know, salt and it doesn't work. So rest is a non-negotiable for me. Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Um, I would say asking for feedback. So when, because you're the business owner or the CEO, whatever, a lot of times there's nobody to give you feedback. You're giving everybody else feedback. But for me, it's like feedback is really important from those you work with and then those in and outside of your business. I like that. And finally, what is your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing a steady paycheck? Um, I would say try small, try lean. I think that's really important. Like you don't have to like leave your full time job if you can find a way to do what you're doing on a small level and then do it enough to grow it so that it becomes profitable and then leave your job. Like it doesn't have to be this big leap that everybody thinks you have to do. It's, it doesn't have to work like that. Absolutely. And so with that, Anika, where can people connect with you, connect with Nubian Human after the show? Yeah, so we're located online at nubianhuman.com and it's H-U-E-M-A-N um, dot com. We're also located in Southeast D.C. at 1231 Good Hope Road um, inside the Anacostia Art Center and soon coming to West Reed Street in Baltimore, Maryland. So look out for that. All right. And with that, guys, there you have it. Maybe I'll see you there if you're in D.C. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Thank you so much for being in the guest chair. Thank you for having me. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Side Hustle Pro Facebook community. Go to sidehustlepro.co forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week. Thank you.